Welcome to the first meetup for the Agile Coaching Network. Um, this meetup is really for practitioners by practitioners. So the hope is that you know we can give back to the community talking about the things that we're dealing with in our daily work. We have two talks today. Um, Chris and Rich will kick off with, is it fair to say a different take on the Agile Manifesto? A bit of a revisit. Yeah, let's go with that. Let's that. go with that. Okay. And then Stefan will follow up um, talking about reteaming, um, Uber reteaming, what happens when things start getting a bit chaotic, a bit hectic. Um, as I mentioned, we are recording this. It will go up on YouTube at some point. Um, George, who's in the top left of my screen, um, will do his magic to turn it into something truly amazing. Not that it won't be as it is. Um, so runtime, goodness, how many people are coming in late? Um, runtime is about 30 minutes for the first talk, 10 minutes of Q&A. So if you have a question, um, please put it into the chat. Okay, I will. And for those that know me will know how ridiculous the statement is for me to do logistics, but I will try and keep up with the questions. I've got a spreadsheet and everything to try and pretend like I know what I'm doing. Um, we'll ask the speakers the questions, 10 minute time box. Once that's done, we'll switch over to Stefan and we'll hear about reteaming. Same thing, if you've got questions, please pop them in the chat. Okay, I will do my best to keep up and we'll pose them to Stefan at the end. Um, I guess with that, it's worth getting started. They're still coming in, so they missed my amazing intro. It's their own fault. Well, on YouTube, yeah, yeah. That's okay, fine. so first up we have Chris and Rich talking about, let me get this one. Welcome to the Agile Manifesto. Okay, so Chris and Rich, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, John. Good evening, everyone. Um, so yeah, we, we've changed it slightly since. So uh, hopefully, if you can be a thunder, if you can see the, the screen I'm sharing, that'll be good. Excellent. So um, yeah, um, my name's Chris. Uh, I'm an Agile coach, CSPSM certified. Um, we'll go into a few more details about the, what the Manifesto Challenge is. Sounds really exciting, doesn't it? Something to get your uh, juices flowing. Um, I'll hand over to Richard to do a brief introduction himself. Hello everyone, yeah, ditto, I'm also an Agile coach. Uh, I haven't got many as badges as Chris, but then who has got as many badges as Chris? Possibly Simon, but nobody else apart from that. Um, and yeah, we, we came up with this idea uh, a couple of weeks ago, thought it might be something quite fun. So yeah, thanks for everybody spending a little bit of their evening with us. Uh, you haven't got Bake Off to watch, so what else is there to do, right? Sit down and chat some Agile with us. So thanks for coming along for the ride. Thanks, Rich. Right, we'll get into it. Okay, so first of all, why take the challenge at all? So we really felt that um, we wanted to reacquaint, we, we kind of toyed with some ideas around this, but we came back to reacquainting ourselves with just how relevant the Agile Manifesto is off the back of the Scrum Guide being updated, especially in a period of kind of real uncertainty and chaos. We thought it was quite a valid thing to explore. We wanted to revisit some of the, you know, our own Agile environment uh, and to take more of a creative approach, a bit of a fun approach, to thinking about factors within those kind of contexts. There are some warning signs here. A warning. Yes, this will be a motive. You may even find it quite divisive, but please take it as it is. It's lighthearted. We're gonna go quite quickly through this. There's lots of subject matter here we could go into, but we haven't got enough time. Um, but we'd really at the end uh, like you to collaborate with us. Indeed, so 2020 was a bit of a strange one. Change came whether we liked it or not. A lot of stuff was new. Um, I decided it was a new thing to set up a, a minute little office in the cupboard under my stairs. Who knew that was the best place for my Wi-Fi signal? Uh, I ended up starting up a gym in my front room and spent a lot of sweaty time with a man called Joe. Who knew that was gonna happen? Certainly not me. Bought a new house, got a new job, lots of new stuff happened. Uh, if you can dive to the chat window as well, just to know John, who can tell me, quickest first and first, um, what happened on November the 18th in 2020? We got something new. What happened on November the 18th last year? 
put down your brews, everybody, or your cold beverage of choice. Oh, I should have laid a spirit on that. Well done. I think Nimam, you got there first. <laughs> okay, everyone's coming in. So um, if you can go on to the next slide, Chris. So we got a new wonderful scrum guard. That was great. So a lot, a lot of new stuff and probably people starting some new challenges. That was great. However, um, not everything was new. The one thing we didn't get that was new was a new agile manifesto. So that's what you're all here to help. You didn't realize it by coming along to this thing and John didn't tell you, but that's basically what you're here to do. So you need to remember the time, what are we now, 6.38, the place, have a look around you. You're part of a wonderful new global movement. Remember this moment, because you're basically making the new Agile Manifesto. I mean, we haven't talked about the rights deals, but let's just go with it for the moment, all right? So if you've got a couple of slides, Chris, Chris is going to, going to explain the rules, for what we're going to be doing for coming up with a new Agile Manifesto called the Manifesto. Yeah, thanks, Rich. Yeah, the Manifesto, it took us about five minutes to come up with that. So uh, as <laughs> you can imagine. Um, so the challenge really, we put two rules in place before we could kind of proceed. Um, we felt that the Manifesto values were all encompassing, right? So, you know, whatever you come up with, it has to resonate with the, you know, a wide scenario with, with regard to the agile environment and the context. It can't be too specific. Um, the Manifesto is brutally simple, I put there. Um, it's not masses of, 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 you know, sentences over masses of sentences. It's really simple. I think the maximum actually is three. So we've said we have to do it in no longer than three words, either side of that over qualifier. So those are the rules in terms of the challenge. So what we're going to do, we're each going to come up with two suggestions. Mine are obviously going to be better than Chris's. This is going to be a bit of a battle between us. Uh, and then after that, you get a chance to vote for whichever you think is best. And also we're going to give you the wonderful viewers, the chance to suggest some of your own versions as well. So have those four in mind, uh, the existing ones that are in there, and have a think if you can add anything else that might be better than some of those. But but obviously they won't be better because you're going to take my two as the best suggestions. We will get a chance to vote in a minute. All right. Let me give you the first one, the best one, the most amazing one. So my, my first entry out of the one you're going to select is impact. Next slide. Wait for it. <laughs> Drum roll. Go on, Chris. Impact over product. So apologies for making you slightly hungry. If you're sitting there thinking, I mean, I don't know, Stefan, if these are available in Japan, you could probably get Cheerios everywhere around the world, right? But if you're feeling hungry for a bit of breakfast cereal, apologies. So to me, what I mean by this is, if you go to the next slide, please, Chris, there's a lot of builders around, right? So if you're in the UK, you know Bob the Builder, he can fix anything, right? There's a lot of people building stuff. Lots of organizations have got lots of teams of software developers. They're pushing out stuff left, right, and center. They're running code all over the place. Next slide, Pete, Chris. There's so many ways you can build code now. There's, there's loads of wizards, there's templates. You can go onto sites and download code. Heck, if you're in primary schools in the UK, you're probably even going to Code Club, sitting there at a lunchtime. And if my 11 year old son can bash out a bit of code, that's all great. You even get lots of local authorities in our country who are pushing out low code, no code, no code at all. Just click a few buttons, it spits it out, right? It's easy. Right? Anybody can do it. It's all good. Next slide, please, Chris. And now we're all talking about how great is our DevOps, our, our CI, CD pipelines, right? It needs to be, everything needs to be harder, better, faster, stronger. We can get great security. We, we're all in the cloud, right? We're in the cloud now. You didn't realize it. We're all in the cloud. All these things are available to us to make lots of new, wonderful, great stuff. So that all sounds great, right? I mean, it sounds great. Is there any problem with that? Well, maybe there is one problem. Next slide, please, Chris. So the problem is we're spitting out all this stuff. All these machines are busily firing out products left, right, and center. What we're not actually quite sure is whether it's got any impact whatsoever. Is it changing anyone's behavior? Is it actually delivering, as we often say in Agile, is it delivering value to anybody? Is a, is a customer or an end user actually getting something out of this? Um, and that I think is the big problem. So when it came to think about the Agile Mesh Investor, I thought, well, do you know what? I know I've realized the Scrum Guide and well, well done to, to Nam for coming up with that. Scrum Guide came out, there was all this stuff. So I have product goals now, oh, that's all great. All wonderful. People are you know, used to spitting out product. But actually what you need to do is make an impact. And in terms of making an impact, the definition I like best is the one that comes from Goyko Adic about impact mapping. So his concept where he says, People's change behavior is the best way of demonstrating impact that a product has. So on the next slide, Chris, as I'm sure you're, uh, some of you might have come across before. Uh, next slide, please, Chris. What he was gonna show was a map of an impact map. So Goiko Adjust's concept of an impact map. 
Uh, so effectively, the most important thing about a product is actually making sure it's got an impact and changing the behavior of the user. Uh, and if you don't have that, you don't have anything at all. So I think that impact is much better than product necessarily. So making sure you've got an impact over actually just creating products. I certainly see this a lot in my neck of the woods uh, when I'm working with clients, often in the public sector. We're pushing out a lot of product these days. We've got very good at that. We've even got mature DevSecOps now, all great. But are we making an impact with our products? Well, who cares, we're pushing out products. <laughs> so that's the thing that I would like to focus on. So you're probably sitting there thinking that sounds great, Rich, but I'm still not still not feeling impact over product. Don't think I want to add that to the Agile Manifesto. Absolutely fine, I'll carry on. My second suggestion. So my second suggestion is capabilities over roles. So when I say capability, what I'm thinking about is somebody that has some skill and some experience and effectively that will create you a capability. And why I think that is better than having roles, it's quite a simple one. You can go to, you can go to your favorite search engine of choice and why wouldn't you go to Google? Who bings anymore, right? Who, who nobody uses me? If you go and tap something like agile training and John can close his ears now because it's his entire business model, you know, with coaching some other stuff. If you tap it into Google agile train, you get a lot of results. At last, look, I think it was something like 243 trillion. So the problem is since the Agile Manifesto came around, what we've done is effectively created a whole great big industry uh, around Agile. Um, obviously some people, uh, maybe the slightly crueler ones would say, well, it was possibly somebody's retirement plan to come up with a whole great big training and certification model around that. Uh, and that sounded great, but it felt like to me, and it feels like to me these days, that certainly it was a big plan to monetize all of the Agiles. <laughs> Where, how can we try and make some money out of this? And that sounds great. So now, um, and uh, Chris obviously put up his nice P, uh, big CSPSM badge. I've got the same badge, don't worry. Sorry, I didn't put it up. Everyone talks about the badges these days. If you spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, as I'm sure you probably do, almost the first thing you'll see, you probably won't spend five minutes on LinkedIn without seeing somebody with a great array of great big different badges. And the worst thing is with COVID, right? Everybody last year, what were they spending their time doing? getting a lot more certification. <laughs> so they're all spending time at home, doing some online training, doing a lot of that, and basically getting even more budget. <clears throat> the reason I think that is a problem is that it's not really a great goal to have. Because <laughs> effectively, you'll run out of badges eventually, and what are the right badges to be going for? It's an absolute nightmare to know. What it's not actually doing is helping develop your agile practice necessarily. I think you can go on all these courses, but you're not badging that in reality. What I think also you're losing is actually the best way to try and develop your skills and the best way to try and grow. And the best way of doing that, I think, is starting with one of the most important parts I think about it, which is the retrospective. So effectively looking within yourself and thinking, okay, it's all great having all of these badges, but what I want to try and find out is, what are the skills that I think I've got? Not necessarily what the rock, you know, I need to advance my career. I'm going to be a scrum master. I'm going to be a coach. I'm going to be something else. I'm going to be a, I'm going to join the, the heavy lauded uh, classical group of CSTs. Don't start thinking about a role. What I think you should be doing is thinking about the skills that you've got or even the skills you want to develop. So those, and the best way of doing that is by doing a, you know, retrospective with yourself and trying to work out what your greatest skills are, what are things you might want to learn. So yeah, effectively what I think the best thing to do is, so it's capabilities, over roles rather than chase a CSM or chase something else. I think what would be great is for us to sit down agile people and say, right, I think that, yeah, you know, we need some facilitation in this particular area. We need some coaching in this particular area. Whatever the team is that you're part of, I think we much, much better when you're thinking about agile and think about the manifesto to be thinking about those softer skills rather than be thinking about the roles that we need to be talking about. So that's my two. Over to you, Chris. Now, some of you might have thought I did that on purpose to try and spoil Richard's chances of the, the manifesto uh, challenge being his. Um, unfortunately, my network just bombed out completely, so I profusely apologise. I do apologise for that. So um, I've missed half of Richard's, but I, at least I knew what he was going to say, right? So mine, which is going to be much better because hopefully my network won't bomb out again, is leadership over management. So here's a nice little quote from Zelesnik, who was um, among the founders of a school of thought that integrated leadership and organization studies with psychoanalysis. I quite like those statements there. I'm just going to leave you with that for a couple of seconds. So what is management in an agile environment? So for me, though, when, I, when I put that question, I actually thought um, the question really should be, is there room for management in agile, in, in agile environments? Um, 
Fyle there was a director of a large mining company with about a thousand employees, and he developed 14 principles of management uh, from which the five functions on this slide were derived. Um, Management works really well, I think, personally, in less complex environments where we have a pretty good idea of how and what we're going to build. We can refer to previous processes or people even to figure out the best place to start and learn from those past mistakes. Uh, if any of you are familiar with Stacey's model of complexity, kind of look into there and figure out where you, you lie on that axis. Um, so, so for me, the known pieces of work require a level of planning, commanding and control to achieve a more predictable outcome. Um, it's not to say, however, that we don't look at these five functions in, in agile environments. For example, planning is a good one, right? We like to forecast ahead. Sprint planning is an event that we like to incorporate. We like to coordinate a few things, I'm sure. So I guess the, the main thing for me there that I have a problem with is the command and control structures. Um, ultimately, for me, there is a little um, connection to agile mindsets, values and principles um, with, for this, right? Um, so when we think about agile mindsets, complexity is high and there are many unknowns, which is why I don't necessarily think, um, you know, management um, is right in an agile environment necessarily. Um, okay, so moving on to leadership, um, there's a few quotes on there that kind of resonated with me um, and kind of captured the essence of, of true leadership. Um, so, so for me, in my opinion, good agile leaders, they create an environment that encourages trust and openness. Um, they unlock creativity, they break down organisational barriers and give purpose to people. Um, they also see that leadership exists at all levels, right? Um, they empower, they trust people to approach business problems in a collaborative way. They look at and block in policies and processes, that's really important, that, that just don't make sense or they prevent that agility. How many nonsense processes do you know in your organisations and teams that you've seen? Um, Similarly, they, they start to question the hierarchical norm, right? And they challenge why a decision, for example, takes four people rather than just one person. So for me, it's creating that environment in which people can flourish. Second suggestion, simplicity over complexity. So when I was doing a bit of research, I'd never heard of this guy, right? But it's Vilfredo Pareto. I think I've pronounced that correct. He, he was an economist who derived this principle. Um, back in the day for an imbalance of land ownership in Italy. Uh, so he believed that 80% of consequences came from 20% of the causes. Um, to illustrate this further and make a bit more sense, because I didn't really understand that when I first saw it. So in 1963, yeah, IBM found that about 80% of its computer's time was spent executing just 20% of the instructions. Any guesses for what they, they thought was the solution there? Let's see what I've got in chat. More computers. Um, no, Rich, actually. Um, OK, I'll let you off. So they chose to rework the operating system um, to make the 20% that was being used faster and easier to use and overall uh, improving computer uh, performance. So, so why, oh, why do I see so many teams spend so much time early on in development, at least, loading up features and effort when in reality, a small proportion of them are actually going to be used to their fullest and provide value to the customer. So I think we should start small with the things that are most value and have a focus on minimizing waste. Just another continuation of that. How many times has anyone seen an MVP developed over a series of months with a huge budget and sign off and project boards just for an MVP? And um, an MVP, of course, is a product with just enough features that's useful and it successfully completes its main task. That's all we're looking for in MVP. Um, we can also look to the 10th Agile principle for a bit of inspiration here too. Anyone want to guess what that is? More planning, eh? <laughs> Surely not. It's the simplicity one, isn't it, Chris? Maximizing... The Man, work, not done. work not done. Yeah. Okay, if, if we're in a physical location, I would have given you a Mars bar for that one. So well done. Well done, Simon. So I personally think that simplicity over complexity is fundamental to agile mindsets. It allows us to respond to change with true agility baked in for me. Um, just take a look at how a flatter, more simplified 
hierarchy allows us to collaborate and individuals uh, interact with individuals in a much easier way. Um, ultimately, I believe that products and services are more likely to be valued to our customers when we when we take this consideration into uh, into our minds. So, we've done our work. We've done it really quick. We've gone through leadership and management theory in literally two minutes. Smashed it. Um, smashed it. Over to you. We want to challenge you, the manifesto challenge, right? So what would your pitch be? Rich, over to you to do this bit. Yes, essentially what you can do is if you go over to Poll EV, um, I'll stick it in the chat as well. You can then go and stick your own versions in. I mean, why would you? You just need to retype mine, right? They're, they're the two best ones. Uh, if oh, you can mine. come up with something, <laughs> or, or possibly yours, you know, you might want to go with that. Uh, get in there and pop your own uh, bits and pieces in. And if you want to, you can uh, vote on other people's as well. So you can upvote and downvote them depending on what you think. Uh, so yes, we're going to give you five minutes to do this, what we do. So at the moment, I think we're going to go on for about another 10 minutes because we started a little bit late. If that's all right with you, John, we'll go on to about five past. So we'll do this for about five minutes and then we'll come back. And if and if you feel confident about just explaining a bit about why uh, you've put your version in, that'd be great. Um, and then we'll close and move on to Stefan's talk. Cool. If you go to the next slide, Chris, you can start the timer. I mean, if you want to turn the sound down of this, then please do. If you want to dance it's around, down. please do. If you want to be the crazy dinosaur, you be the crazy dinosaur. Just crack on. Please um, have fun with this. <laughs> we, I mean, we, we're going to give prizes the best dancer, right, Rich? Yeah, definitely. Two right. There you go. Five minutes, guys. Five seconds to go. Done. Cool. All done. All right. Whew. So thanks, everybody, for tapping some stuff into there. Some really, really interesting suggestions coming in there. Obviously, none as good as Chris's and, and myself. But yeah, really interesting stuff to see stuff coming in there. Let me just have a quick flip through what we've got. Um, mm -hmm. So simplicity over complexity, leadership over management, look like they're coming out really high. What I quite liked, um, I quite like to treat people as equals over establish a hierarchy. <laughs> uh, that was a really nice one for me. Would anyone like to own up to creating that one? Do you want to give a little bit of context about that one? Where that came from, why that was there? That was ours, Richard. Oh. <laughs> Next. <laughs> <laughs> That's rude. Okay. D delete. No, that's lovely. Go on, Lynn. Why did you put that one in there? What did you say? I can't remember what it was. Oh, it was a hierarchy one. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's, if Three even though I dial, it's all about self-organizing teams, in practice, people seem to like structure and they like hierarchy and they like to put people in leadership and manager roles. And we often mm -hmm. see people as a self-appointed team lead. So it'd be nice if people treated each other as equals, not as part of a hierarchy, rather than try to establish hierarchies where, where they're not needed. It's also, yeah. About, um, yeah, I think people put um, role titles and job titles over people's qualifications and skills. And it was about trusting people that they have the right skills to do the job um, by you know, trusting them through enabling them to do it rather than um, getting, getting stuck on these role job, you know, job titles and roles. Yeah, it's really interesting. I've just gone through a process where I've just gone through my own job title. And actually, I didn't have one for the first six months. I mean, it didn't matter. <laughs> But people got really upset about the fact that, well, I'm a tech lead. I'm more senior than them. I have to be a tech lead as right. Let's go back to the manifesto. Should we have a look at what Scrum says about team roles? Like you're either in the development team or you're not. It doesn't matter what, you know. So it is really interesting exactly about people trying to establish a hierarchy uh, yeah, when, there, when there doesn't need to be one. No, so that's your interesting. So thanks for that one. Um, uh, what else have we got there? Do, 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 do. Chris, do you want to pick one out? Has anything grabbed your fancy? I did like purpose over tasks. I like that one. Um, I kind of like collaboration over ice. Do you know what? I like all of them, to be fair. I know that's really, really <laughs> hard, hard. You know, I shouldn't say that, but to be fair, I do. Um, I like the face-to-face -face conversations over online messages. That's good, as long as it's virtually uh, held, of course. Um, you know, build, measure, learn over build, build, build. I think the point of this, I guess, is what we were trying to get at, Rich, here for, for everyone, is, is to generate these kind of ideas, because it really does make you think about these things. Um, yeah, so I realize we're running out of time, but uh, but yeah, yeah, there are some really great suggestions there. Thanks for taking some time to put some bits and pieces in. 
Do you want to go on to the next slide, Chris? And uh... Yeah. Thank you, everyone, by the way. So, um, yeah, what do we actually learn then? Given, given everything we've said uh, and our technical prowess to get volume working and <laughs> bombing out of networks, um, what did we learn? Um, we found it incredibly difficult in the end to argue with the Agile Manifesto as is, right? I know that's a really lame way of ending it, um, but we really did. Um, early on, we also realized that a lot of the suggestions we were making are covered by the 12 principles. So we also went back to the principles and kind of checked ourselves there, to be honest. Um, ultimately, though, hopefully what we've proved here is we felt this exercise not only makes you really think about the values and the mindset piece, but it creates great discussion amongst your teams. And even for people who aren't accustomed to agile context, it's a really good basis to form those conversations with people. Um, so the challenge back to you is we really want to see if this generates any more interest across you know, various social media platforms. We already started the conversation with mixed results, I must say. Some people just didn't get it, uh, but that's fine. It's embryonic. embryonic. It's embryonic. Um, we'd love for you here uh, to leave and start using this hashtag this evening, next few days, just to see what it generates, see how many people we can annoy, um, but also to generate some ideas uh, amongst our community. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess for myself, thank you very much for listening to us. Um, sorry about the glitch. I do apologise. Yeah. You can reach me on those details. Rich, over to you for a final goodbye. Yeah, yeah. Again, thanks very much for bearing with us while we uh, coped our way through that. It's it's at least the first sprint. We'll be fine by the time we get to the next product demo. We'll be absolutely fine. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, Chris and Rich. Um, great to return to the Agile Manifesto every now and again and look a bit deeper at it. I noticed you didn't ask who did purpose and ta over tasks, which isn't fair. It's me. Who did purpose? Well, we knew that. That's why we didn't ask you. And yeah. it, got a high, it got a high vote as well, so good job. <laughs> My way of bragging. <laughs> um, thank you very much. There have been no questions. Obviously, people were too engaged um, to do. But we have 10 minutes now. Um, if there are any questions for Chris and Rich, I'm going to start timer. Questions or comments, please. Feel free to put them in the chat if you don't want to say it out loud. I'll ask or ask it yourself. I think what we realised is that um, certainly doing this activity, it's a bit like the kind of some of you might have used the kind of pocket principles game uh, before when you try and rewrite some of the the 12 principles, when you think about the values, actually, the advantage is that they're not specific. Uh, you know, that's the point that Chris was trying to make, that they are more general and more vague. However, you know, a lot of stuff has changed over that point. So maybe there are things that we need to try and try and establish. Humans don't change as much as you think. And I think things like, uh, well, the point we were just talking about, people needing a hierarchy or feeling like they need a hierarchy. Um, I think it's probably one of those things that never changes. But, but certainly leadership has changed. Um, you know, the conversation about leadership management have changed over that bit of time. Building to learn rather than building to earn, which is one of the, the classic Jeff Pratton phrases. So it's really interesting to see that coming out of that build, measure, learn. But now I'd be interested to find out what people think, whether it needs revising or not. The only thing I think uh, we should revise is the term software in there. I think Agile has yes. got so much more widespread now in terms of the Agile mindset and context. Mm. And I don't think it, it needs to be just to apply to software. And I know they have reviewed that and they came back to it and they stuck with software because of the intention and the intent around what it was built for. But I think you know the term software is very technically focused towards developing particularly software products. And I think Agile is so much more widespread now that I think it's making yeah. it feel a bit out of date and that it can't be applied to things such as organizational agility or non-solution, you know, technically solution delivered teams. And actually, I think it can. Everything else in there stands true. Do you know what, interestingly, um, Lynn, that's exactly where we started. We kind of looked at actually, you know, I know it was, you know, 20 years ago, a bunch of people um, were kind of on the software development side. Um, but actually, it, it's come along leaps and bounds, whether we like it or not. Yeah. Uh, and I think we need to take, think in terms of a bit wider than just software. So I absolutely agree with you on that. And it's not really just about software anymore, is it? It's about, you know, theory X and theory Y and all of those sorts of concepts. And I think, you know, it, if you look at its roots, it's come from all of these these areas. And I think, you know, the agile word has enabled it to push that theory X and theory Y 
um, you know, theory X into theory Y. And I think that's been really much needed within, you know, our societies and, and that sort of management theory mm. moved forward. And it's nice that Agile can do that. But while it's still got software in the manifesto, it constrains it somewhat, I think. Mm. What I find strange is that um, because, as you said, if you trace all those bits back to uh, you know, extreme programming, other bits and pieces, pair program, all these kind of strange software concepts, you wouldn't have thought that would have naturally worked in a world where you know you can now go to an HR conference and hear people talk about agile HR practices. But I do love the fact that you can take something like pair programming and, and Chris and I effectively almost kind of pair presented, not just this, but in terms of us creating this presentation in the first place. So I love the fact that you can take these, you know, really strange, hoary technical software concepts and just apply them to everything else, which I don't think there's much, much else that you can take from software and then apply it to HR or a management team or an operational team or, or anything like that. So no, that's what I love about it, that flexibility. Fantastic. I've got a question for you, Chris and Rich. How often do you find yourselves referring back to the manifesto when coaching teams? I'll take I, the I, please I, Chris, yeah. add the second half to it. Mm -hmm. And how often do you find the correct understanding? So if, if I do the first bit there, Rich, it's, it's yeah. quick. I, I think I was just typing it actually. So I spend more time as a coach now referring to values, principles, and mindset. And I do frameworks and methodologies. So if I look back two years ago when I was first start, really starting coaching uh, seriously, I, you know, when you cringe a little bit, when you look back at something, oh, no, I didn't say that, did I? I didn't I didn't just keep bleating on about Scrum, did I? Um, of course, that stuff's important, right? That really is important. But what does unlock that non-software area, at least, is talking about the, you know, the principles and the manifesto, values, mindset, Scrum values as well. They're a great ones to they're great ones to refer to. So um, I don't start I don't correct the understanding of it. I think a lot of it is up for interpretation sometimes. But um, I think if you can under if you realise the underpinnings of the, you know the principles underpinning those values, it all makes sense. Um, so yeah, long way of saying I I, I I refer to them all the time. Sorry, Rich, over to you. No, that's fine. Um, no, great question. Thank you. I think I probably refer. <laughs> refer to correct and most of the time so back in the real world back in you know pre pc pre-covid um most of the working areas that i was in i would try and make sure that they had those up on the wall they had the values and the principles printed up because often i just found it really useful to say right can we just all look at that and see what that says no 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 next to the fire exit no no next to the work agreement <laughs> the bit on the end the dusty bit with the coffee cup marks on because often people didn't remember it or they think they half remembered it I guess it's like you know a film that you watched a long time ago or an album that you listened to a long, long, long time ago. Can you really remember what the intro is on track one? Maybe not. I did find, oh, I do find that people don't remember them. So um, yeah, I, I talked about that pocket principles game, which is where you get people to rewrite them, which works quite nice in a, you know, one or two words. I, I often have that little A5 bit printed out. It's often stuck somewhere inside my folder just so I can refer to it and bring it out and go there. So yeah, more often, unfortunately, than I would like it. But that's fine. I think working as an agile coach, one of the things I'd say is that you're only as good as explaining those values and principles. They're very much the kind of the core of anything. So if any of you have a faith or a following or a practice or a hobby, whatever it is that you like doing, unless you can explain what those core concepts are and have those to hand, uh, I don't think you're a very good, whatever it is you are, beekeeper or, uh, or yoga teacher. So I think you have to have those up on the wall. I think you have to refer those all the time. And I think that's, I think that's just natural. Um, I wouldn't expect them to live and breathe it all of the time, but it's quite nice. I often use it as when I'm working with teams or individuals, as often a way of kind of um, maybe de-escalating a situation because it's just a nice uh, unemotive thing that you can just point to and say, right, let's just look at that. What does everyone think that means? What does that mean to you? Um, why did you put that other word in there instead? Uh, so it's sometimes quite nice to use that as a bit. So that's why I also like them on the wall. So yeah, more often than I'd like is the short answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we've got time for one more question, if there is. We've got a few minutes left. If, if there isn't, it's just you know again, just to kind of say. If you want to, if you want to create this into your, your you know, in social media platforms and, and the, the, the groups and teams you're associated with, I'd really love to see that manifesto challenge hashtag. I'm not forcing you, but I think it'd be interesting to see what people make of it. Um, so please have fun with it. Remember the rules, and uh, I hope to see some out on, on the, the Twitter sphere somewhere. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much again, Rich and Chris, um, for an interesting re-exploration of the Agile Manifesto.